thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today and uh, welcome to the third session uh, for today's event. And I personally am very uh, excited for, uh, you know, this theme because, um, you know, today um, we live in an era that is, we just talked about digital detox and everything. We live in an era that is, you know, digital, uh, social first, and you know where businesses are more than just businesses, more than just economic commodities or entities, uh, and they have a bigger role to play. Uh, so having said that, uh, when I say digital, I mean there, there are so many mediums, so many channels today where you can engage, communicate, uh, get aware, you know, get your awareness from, and uh, uh, then social first, you know, uh, it's it's funny because uh, at times when you are a you're a brand that you know people very popular brand and people know about you and you're representing the brand uh, or a public figure, people even if you don't want to react to something, a social you know uh, some some incident or a social cause or something, they would want your reaction and they would then react to it, and then it's for for the science. Uh, those who had science in their, you know, college uh, or school days, it's a chain reaction, uncontrolled one at times, yeah. So uh, for us uh, as, uh, you know, brand managers, brand custodians, it's very important to understand, uh, you know, when to react, how to react, where to react, and very importantly, where to draw the line. Uh, so, uh, uh, like, we're fortunate that we have a very, you know, uh, talented expert uh, set of, you know, experts today uh, who are already navigating these waters and uh, today are here with us to, you know, pave the way for us. Uh, I'll uh, dive right in, Tanya Singh, and we have, like I said, an, ex an extraordinarily talented bunch of experts. So, I'll just start. Um, First of all, uh, the, the, the theme that is, you know, finding a common ground, navigating corporate activism and cultural sensitivity. Let's first just understand, uh, because we, we, we do have some understanding what corporate activism is, but, you know, let's just hear from the experts what their definition of corporate activism is. Ma'am, if, uh, Tanmana, ma'am, if you could just let us know. Tanmana, okay, thanks. Hello? Um, it's a very heavy term, but uh, I personally feel that walking the talk is very important when it comes to corporate activism. For instance, the organization that I represent, we talk about environment, we talk about sustainability, we talk about carbon emissions, and these are the terminologies one keeps hearing from morning to evening. Are we actually doing what we are working on? Some parts, yes. Some examples that uh, typically uh, we follow are do not travel a lot. We do a lot of online meetings, even with overseas partners. Now, when, when we're talking about reducing carbon emissions, are we practicing? Yes. But that is something which a lot of corporates I see may not be doing it. They're probably doing it more as a branding option or a PR option. So maybe we could work around that for a better, uh, for more efficacy. That's my point of view. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. No, no, I just want to know from Sonal, would you like to tell us about, you know, what corporate activism is uh, for brands today? Is it just limited to a PR stunt? Or, you know, uh, there is more meat to it, there's more, uh, you know, more value that brands can actually look uh, to add to it. Okay. So, well, you know, as you said, people uh, write something or something happens and yeah. then uh, people are expecting a response from you. So on that, I had read something very cheeky that somebody had said that open your mouth, not because you have to say something. Open your mouth because you have something to say. So only if you have something of relevance to say, should you add to the conversation or jump onto the bandwagon. As far as corporate activism is concerned, I think activism has become a fashionable term. Yeah. Otherwise, corporate citizenship was always in vogue. And I would still prefer that option because activism has a color of impulse. It has a color of uh, trying to fit in with the vibe of Gen Z in order to stand for a cause for the sake of it, which is a very dangerous trap. So in my view, corporate activism or corporate citizenship 
should be there as a part of the ethos of the company and it has to be aligned with the values of the company otherwise it starts to look like a pr gimmick also it will have a very short shelf life so there will be no correlation between the cause and the company yeah like you mentioned short shelf life you know today everything trends anything can trend you never know you never know if you are reacting to some post it could just you know make news the next day so how do you ensure and uh, you know as representatives or uh, you know as leaders representing a brand that okay if this is what my uh, organization or brand believes and this is where i need to limit do it, so i just want to know do these kind of thoughts come to your mind because you would also have your personal opinion towards something but then you would have to limit it on social so how how do we balance that absolutely so you know i believe the job of copcom is two way one is it's like the job of kalidas in his age or the job of amir khusro in their age so not only do you tell about the the ethos of the present times you also set the narrative for your leadership as a soft influencer so that does not mean that you stand up for every cause you know uh, i do not know the key to success but the key to failure is to please everyone so it is understanding what you stand for and sticking to that on a long term basis so that when people are talking about like ms rath said you know uh, uh, recently a coffee major was under criticism because they are selling coffee in paper cups but their ceo was taking the private jet to and fro to work every day so what is it that you truly stand for and you can stand for that cause for as long as you live correct and not uh, not falling into the trend uh, Uh, trend trap trend trap <laughs> unless you are a very b2c company uh, which right. can afford to joke about it in a very light hearted way yeah yeah that's a smart idea then correct uh, girish spe- uh, specifically this question is for you because uh, you know like we discussed that we have to follow some like stick to the values of the brand uh, you founded a, you know a company a good company on purpose and um, how do you decide or that okay for like my company would take a stand for this because it can backlash it could you know it could uh, it could divide your customers base it could divide your uh, employees how do you ensure that all stakeholders internal external are aligned and who exactly takes that decision okay we are we we choose this this is something that's trending and we choose this uh, we, we we will stand by it so Uh, this this entire process is something that if you could just uh, throw some light on uh, thank you uh, the honest truth is there isn't a process i think it's <laughs> it's a it's um it's it, it's like a question that we have to tackle and navigate on a day to day basis and make choices on a day to day basis i can tell you f- for example from the way in which we choose our clients Right. that's also us expressing a stand on the kind of clients we work with and the kind of work we want to do because we set up this company to stand for a particular set of values to bring about social change okay. so that directly sort of impacts how we filter the clients that we choose to work with and those that we don't and that i can tell you in 7 years now has become an ongoing uh debate in the company on an ongoing uh, basis because at the end of the day we're also making choices between profit and purpose which is okay. they can be high paying clients which can offer a lot of profit but then we have to choose to st- either stick to you know the purpose that we started with or do we dilute in order to scale so those are very real challenges that we face on a day to day basis and um, it could be a very long conversation for right. this panel <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, Josa, if I can ask you, ma'am, uh, the thing is that um, now, if we are to define cultural sensitivity, you know, in 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 the context of you know corporate activism, uh, how how would you define it? Um, I would simply say that it is um, important to recognize, respect. and then also at the same time adapt to you know whatever other cultural norms the challenges etc that you have and ensure that you know you are respecting and including everybody into the conversation and aware of the 
uh, you know, the communities that you're engaging with, that's the most important thing, I think. And uh, unless you respect and include even your uh, marginalized communities and ensure that you are not having a narrative which is negative or is seen as negative, you know, sometimes it might be accepted in certain parts of the country, might not be accepted in certain other parts, considering India is a multicultural Okay. Uh, you know, country with so many languages, religions, caste, etc. It's very important to be sensitive to the needs of each of the communities who you're working with. And, um, you know, like uh, Sonal has rightly mentioned, uh, tokenism versus, uh, say, a long term commitment. That's what is more important. You're doing it as a one off activity and uh, or you're committed to it is important. So cultural sensitivity, sensitivity in that sense, when it comes to uh, corporate activism, is to be able to uh, recognize, then respect, and also adapt to the changes that are there to be able to engage effectively. Thank you. And um, so we see today a lot of brands reacting to a lot of things. Uh, then a lot of conversations arising from you know the reaction. Uh, can you just? point out or, or just let us know what are those few things or few challenges that brand face or the gaps that, you know, uh, basically um, when you're communicating that you sh should, you know, think of filling in so that you don't end up making it all a risk uh, and it's, it's, it's a good opportunity for you. So it's important to understand the historical and social context that is there. Sometimes there are, uh, you know, symbols and uh, sometimes there are languages. In fact, one of the uh, classic examples would be when you had one of the members of a royal family wearing a particular symbol which was not acceptable and that became, you know, a conversation for a lot of people abroad uh, and a lot of conversation around it. So it's important to be aware of all of these and ensure that the conversation that you're having uh, is beyond a corporate agenda, but you are engaging effectively with the community you want to engage with. And I will give a very classic example. I mean, all of us know about uh, the Tata Steel's um, LGBTQ uh, campaign that they ran, you know, it was very, very effective because it ran on the premise of inclusivity and love, empathy, etc. Now, whereas the same organization for Titan, when they had, an, you know, the campaign that they ran when they had uh, a Muslim family who was um, celebrating, I think, the baby shower of their daughter-in-law who was a Hindu, didn't go very well. Whereas, personally, if you ask me, I thought it was a brilliant piece of ad, you know. And, uh, but they had to withdraw. So it's also important to be aware of the feedback take that feedback and react immediately, which Zomato, for that matter, did very effectively, you know, for that um, food has no religion, you know. So when they had the backlash, immediately they were able to react to it. So it's also respecting, adapting, and reacting to feedback effectively. So I think those are the key points when you take into consideration uh, when to keep in mind for cultural correct. sensitivities. Absolutely. Um, Prasida, I believe that you been, you uh, work with different markets. Uh, how do you how do you see you know uh, cultural sensitivity being balanced uh, in other markets um, as compared to India? Okay. Um, thank you for the question, Danya. I think at an organizational level, um, culture and cultural sensitivity are things that are defined more um, as the DNA of the company itself, okay. right? So while country to country, region to region, things differ, which is more of investing in a better understanding of the cultural nuances locally, uh, but beyond that, it is literally sort of having that very clear definition of how do you want to run your business? How do you want to like engage your people? 
how do you want to really build that community, whether it's with your employees or your customers? So it wouldn't really vary from that perspective, but it'll be more about investing that time to understand things. Like for instance, um, when I work with, you know, probably uh, teams in other markets and even in the past uh, roles, I would try and understand that, okay, what is their working style? Like what does a certain, uh, how is a certain conversation needed to be conducted? Like little things like maybe a certain geography believes more in a consensus-led decision-making system versus another where it doesn't necessarily need to be their hierarchy kind of wins. And as much as we would hate it, but that's probably how it runs in certain uh, geographies. Um, and more in terms of, you know, when we talk about, say, corporate activism and kind of companies taking a stance uh, and trying to influence a certain decision in a certain direction, I think it's a lot more about being authentic and finding and seeking that common ground, right? Um, it is impossible uh, to build a company where everybody agrees to a decision or to a stance that the company wants to take. We'll all have our views, some personal, some would be a little more, um, you know, influenced by things that we would have probably gone through in our personal life or previous organization or something we believe morally is the right thing to do. But when you come into taking a stance for an organization as the custodian of the company's reputation and have that power in your hand, I think it's just so much more about seeking that balance uh, where you're being authentic, you know the impact of your stance could be losing out some customers, it could be probably impacting some employees who might feel marginalized by that decision, and that's bound to happen. But you know, have you found a, a common ground which the majority sort of understands? Is your, is your approach a lot more um, humanitarian, so to say, because uh, I think that is one area where most people do agree and have a certain stance. And then keeping in mind legal implications, reputation, long-term strategy, sustainability, uh, and sometimes even budgets. Yeah. You know, all of that sort of comes into the picture. No, so Prasida, like you mentioned that uh, a brand can lose out on customers, but uh, the idea or your stand needs to be how do you weigh that okay customers first or reaction first because th there have been instances and it's it's i'm talking about a very you know global popular footwear brand who has lost you know a uh, majority of his its customers because they took up they, they took up a stand on a political issue so how do you weigh that, okay, this is, my customers are more important, business is more important, how do you balance business and opinion? Hmm, that's interesting. And I think that is also extremely tough and challenging. Okay. You know, it is not going to be an easy answer. Uh, it totally depends on things that the company is not ready to compromise on. So, um, for instance, if it, is, if it is something that you really strongly feel matters to you and could have sort of a strong business impact but you know that that is the ethos like if you don't do take that action or take that stance that also means that we will have a large number of our customers employees shareholders also sort of have a view um, and and there is like in that implicit expectation from you to do what is right uh, so if that is the pressure under which the company is, you do take that stand and you do often lose out on customers like, you know, uh, the example that you're quoting. Um, and I think what is interesting over there is to not just look at the dip in the customers that you see in the short run, but long term, how is it going to help? Is that creating a new ecosystem? Is it opening new doors? Is it like really opening up a conversation which is going to benefit the community that you operate in uh, in the right way? Then, then that's probably something to really take a stance on. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I think yeah, just please. to add to what Pratsida said, you know, it's aligning with the community objectives versus corporate agenda. That's what's most important. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, very good question. And I think the uh, answer, the way to measure what you will do is how far you are seeing into the future. So if you're if you're very sure of your long-term goals, then that decision is a very easy one to make. And uh, one of my past employers was a public sector undertaking, which, which made steel. 
that meant acquiring acres of land and displacing a lot of people. Now, who do you please? The displaced people community who are going to immediately disrupt your business and who have a lot of vested interests, or the tribals in that area who've been suffering for ages, and if you bring them up to date, if you give them employment, bring them into a modern healthcare, mainstream them, then that's going to give you dividends, but in the long run. That's a very easy choice to make. Correct. So you have to have a Especially vision. Especially when vision. you are looking at a social change, it is a long drawn process and you will have challenges, you know, you will have bureaucracy mm -hmm. hurdles, you'll have legal hurdles, all of it. But as long as you know what is the long term commitment you have and what's the goal you want to achieve, I think it all falls into place. Girish wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. I do. Um, so great question, Danya. And I think the footwear brand that yes. you're referring to, I think what it did was it did see an initial dip. But I think after a while, it saw a huge resurgence because when you say no to a certain, you know, type of audience, you're actually giving a lot of power to those who believe in your yes. And that loyalty, when it comes back to you as a brand that's taken a stand, the ripple effect of that lasts much longer. Uh, Girish, but we uh, totally uh, like partially agree. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the thing is that, um, you know, today in this age of, you know, where everybody is on social, very active, uh, you, it's very easy to form, uh, you know, uh, like opinion about a brand. If there are bad reviews, like I don't like this brand doing this, taking a stand, then what to do? Like, how do you navigate this? Uh, yeah, ma'am. So getting affected by these things are only going to diminish your long-term objectives. And over a period, it dies down. So we just have to ignore certain things if we have to achieve what we actually have set out to. And that is most important to keep that focus, something like Arjuna used to do. And just okay. have to keep the rest of the things away to be able to achieve. That's, you know, what I would say. No, no, absolutely. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I had a couple of, I was curious how you guys were interpreting this. Um, to me, corporate activism is when you're taking a stand on something very controversial and difficult and putting yourself out there. Frankly, I'm not seeing it in India, right? It's not happening here, yeah, right? Is. Corporate activism is, um, you know, when companies in the US, for example, took a stand against the Trump Muslim ban and most tech CEOs and then other CEOs and kind of stood out against this. Um, we rarely see corporate activism in India. We pussyfoot around. We have seen severe polarization, politicization. We haven't had companies speak out for right reasons. We're all aware of them. So first of all, how are you? Like, it's not social responsibility. It's much bigger than that. So I would love to know how are you all interpreting this in the first place when we talk about corporate activism. So I, I agree with you, Minari. I, I think it's a Western phenomena. I think this, you know, the narrative is that Gen Zs apparently and the millennials want to believe in brands that stand for things, that have values that they can align with. And of course, in the West, we've seen examples of that. In, in India, it's much tougher, I do agree. The only example I can think of, of course, is, you know, when Zomato did take a stand and say food has no religion, I think that was one, one good example. But beyond that, I think unless it's, it's directly related to your business, and I think all of us as advisors to brands would also say, you know, stay out of it for now. And that was exactly going to be my question, Girish. Do we even recommend to our clients or our leaders you know, to even speak out because there are cultural and country-based contexts which make these really, really hard. Um, and it make it really difficult, you know, because these are, these are measured questions. So, yeah, it's, you know, when Black Lives Matter happened, everyone in US or most corporates stood out for this. 
On the other hand, when there is this whole big conversation around wokeness and DEI today, it's become a very difficult topic in the US today because big, well-known names like Elon Musk are speaking out against it. So it's no longer that given, and it's a very difficult. So these are very, so I think it's really important to understand how are we as communicators understanding and recommending, like what are the factors, I think for the audience here, I think it would be helpful to understand how to weigh, because there is a time to speak out and there is a time to not, and it's fair. Okay. So because it impacts lives, you know, when companies speak out, it's not just something to do for the good of it, there are lives impacted. So and also as what communicators, you yeah, I mean, as communicators, how do we really recommend? I would love to really have all of you there, you know, maybe have a little bit on that as well. So just two things very quickly on this. Um, one is, of course, you know, um, as Minari has alluded, there is also a backlash happening against a lot of the DNI and sustainability conversations in the West because investors are questioning the value of it and whether it's actually giving them the brands the returns that they were told these would have. And that is one thing I believe as communicators, then it becomes our role almost to stand firm for it because we have to be the conscience of our organizations, even if it comes at, at, at the cost of very tough conversations in the boardroom. That's number one. The second challenge that I have faced with clients from a corporate activism perspective is when the leader or the founder or the CEO has a very strong point of view okay. on an issue, but then helping them sort of make right between their personal position and something that's going to impact the reputation of the brand, I think is where I've faced the most challenge and I'd be very interested to hear from the rest here. So I'll just add, your mic is not on. One very small thing here. Your mic is not on. Like you rightly mentioned, Larger issues in India, we are still at a very nascent stage. We don't take sides at all. But even smaller things, like in our organization, we were about to run a campaign, or we did run the campaign finally, uh, which involved Lokmanya Tilak. And this was to be run in Maharashtra. And there was a certain context that we wanted to set. And suddenly there was an opinion that came in which said that, you know, uh, we'll have to be very careful in Maharashtra because um, Maratha, Manush, all of that. So what we did as an organization was run it past some of our partners there in Maharashtra and again run it past in Gujarat and West Bengal to get diverse views and were then finally able to go live, you know. But we did run it past through certain, you know, diverse groups, communities to be able to get a feedback and see how they perceive it. Because, see, we are sitting at the headquarters running a campaign which will go live in a different part of the country involving various issues that are there. So that's why uh, at the beginning I did mention that it's very important to understand the historical and social context, you know, understanding the background and, as well as the current social, uh, you know, dynamics that are there that will shape the public opinion is very important. So how do we, uh, you know, navigate all of that is issue. But these are far smaller as compared to much larger issues that you're talking about, which we don't do as yet. So before you answer uh, Minari's question, I have two more thoughts to put in your head. One is, uh, you know, you mentioned social activism versus business uh, outcome. Uh, somebody did mention that if you have a social activism, you know, if there is a lot of things that are happening online that impacts the business. We've Correct. seen one yes. example in Kunal Kamra's thing. However, it is category agnostic. I is it category agnostic? No, because when, uh, a, a, a social media nutritionist food farmer, I might as well name him, uh, brought about this whole chaos around one particular brand. Uh, I was, uh, I happened to be working in the same category at that time. And we actually did a complete mapping to see, because of the one year long campaign that he was running, what was actually impact on the actual business. And there was zero impact, zero. So in some categories, 
it doesn't matter what is the Twitter universe saying. So the social activism, so when, what I, why I'm bringing this up is that so when we are looking at it with a lens of communication, we need to understand. There are some, so in one case, there was a challenge by the CEO, which brought about like an ego issue. In the other, other situation, the gateway to nutrition of the family, which is the mother, was not impacted by what was happening in the twi uh, Twitter universe. That was my first point. The second was, we also touched upon um, investor activism. A large part of activism of a corporate is determined by the investor activism. And that's be becoming huge in the West. I don't think we have seen that so much in India yet, but it is huge in the West. So much so that the corporate values are getting underplayed yeah. because of the investor activism. So I'd like you guys to comment on that. And the final thing is, just wanted to leave an example behind of how this activism, of uh, corporate activism and sensitive, cultural sensitivity played out is a work that Dove had done in the US on the Crown Act. So a Crown Act is basically a coalition which has worked with the, 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 the community against, to, pre to start a law that prevents racial discrimination based on black, black, black women's hair. So read up about it, and I thought that was an ex excellent, you know, what do you Example. call it, common ground. Correct. Yeah? So over to you guys. So I would like to start with answering Minari's question. As communicators, what is it that we recommend to our management? So the first thing we recommend to ourselves and our management is to not come under pressure. Each culture has its own context, and while activism in one part of the world may become very important for them and their business, I'm not very sure how it affects their margins as of now, but in India, we understand the context that we are operating in, and we also understand that the reputation is born out of two things. One is the company image, and the other is the founder's image. Like you said, in one case, the CEO was very possessive about what he wanted to say. So the company is not one person's company alone, especially when it's a listed company. The listed company has investment and sentiments of a cross-section of audience, some of who do not even associate with the cause that the world is getting mad about. So what is the need to jump into that discussion in a country where 360 degree of your audience do not feel the same way about it? So that is one. Uh, as far as the promoter is concerned, in that reputation building, we always try to help him be more and more authentic. But the key word, at least the operative word here for me personally, is balance. What is it that you can do in order to balance your perspective? So for order, before you go ahead and say something on Twitter or LinkedIn, please look into the subject, please research well. Do not be one of the thousand voices who are just jumping there in order to say something. And once you say it, say it with nazakat. कौन सी बात कब कहाँ कैसे कही जाती है ये सलीका हो तो हर बात सुनी जाती है। Awesome, <laughs> that's a very good line. Exactly what I had mentioned in the beginning, you know, the same organization when they did the Tata Steel ad for LGBT and Tanishk ad, you know, it was a beautiful, personally, if you ask me, I thought it was a brilliant ad, you know, but they did have to withdraw. But we do live in an organization, I mean, we do live in an atmosphere or an environment which is like that. <laughs> yeah, but Tata actually Especially stood by then. it. Look at all the uh, uh, ads that they would have done. It is done brilliantly. <laughs> that uh, uh, Dove's um, ad, which was the. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Dove's uh, Done With Care. Uh, what was the uh, Dove ad, which was with. Uh, uh, the uh, transgender, the uh, servant lady where she's adopting um, a, child, a child, you know, it was brilliantly done, wash with care. I don't know. 
सो दैट वॉज अ ब्रिलियंट एड बट दैट वॉज अगेन अ वेरी सेंसिटिव सब्जेक्ट दैट दे टुक अप बट द वे दे एड्रेस्ड इट वॉज थ्रू मदर्स लव एम्पथी केयर ना दैट इज समथिंग विच रन अक्रॉस ऑल कम्युनिटीज एट्सेट्रा सो इट्स ऑल्सो द नरेटिव हाउ यू पिक इट अप हाउ यू प्लेस इट एंड राइटली सेड मिनारी हाउ एवर यू नो वेल यू माइट प्रोजेक्ट इट इट माइट बैकफायर और इट माइट पोलराइज सर्टन सेक्टर्स इट्स अबाउट बींग सेंसिटिव टू सर्टन मार्जिनलाइज कम्युनिटीज एज वेल एज एंगेजिंग विद द रेस्ट Uh, we understand it's a very uh, <laughs> interesting topic. We don't want to end it. We are told to end. <laughs> no, exactly. I just want to say we we because you mentioned like we don't do that much in India because India I think is a very di- culturally very diverse you know nation and we can't please everybody. Nazakat se like you say Nazakat se bhi bolenge to koi na koi naraz hoga hi. ठीक है so uh, that being said. Um, <laughs> correct everybody today as is is very sensitive uh, and we have all the mediums to okay absolutely thank you thank you so much for being a wonderful audience and thanks for the panel